The next section we're going to deal with is the Roaring Twenties. When we finished our discussion before, we left off at the end of World War I and the age of Wilson, and we kind of got him all the way through that. We had Wilson have his, his heart attack, kind of be paralyzed by a stroke, all this. And now we're coming into this, this time period that, to me, really feels like the first modern time period uh, that we've studied. I feel like I could have survived in the 20s. They're, 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 they're a much more modern kind of society than we've, we've seen before. Kind of to set the mood, that top left picture is uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald and his wife Zelda. They were like the it couple of the time period. They were the, uh, the party couple that, that, that was at everything. You might have seen, uh, read F. Scott Fitzgerald's books like The Great Gatsby or seen that really weird movie. Uh, that middle picture is a speakeasy, which was an illegal bar. The top right and the bottom left are both the modern woman of the 1920s, the flapper, the independent chick of the 20s. Uh, that middle picture is an album, and it's, I, I find this humorous, so I put it up here. This album was a big hit. It was called The Profiteering Blues. This is a time period when, when, when everybody was doing so well economically, even the blues albums was about I'm making too much money. Okay? And the bottom right picture is a cover of Life magazine, and that weird move they're doing is the Charleston. It was the single biggest dance of the time period. So we kind of got, got a feel for what's going on. All right, so let's pick back up where we left off with this idea of a paralyzed White House. We know that President Wilson had a stroke in his last term as, as president. He, uh, uh, he's, he's left paralyzed, at least on, on the left side of his body, at least partially paralyzed. He could still walk and move eventually, but his, his face always had that, that semi-paralyzed look. But it also had the effect on him that a lot of strokes have on people. That it, have you ever known somebody that's had a stroke? A lot of times, all of their characteristics become that much more exaggerated. He became more temperamental, harder to get along with, and more certain that he was right on everything. Made him very hard to get along with. It also left us in a really strange situation. That picture you see at the bottom right there is Edith Wilson. Edith was Wilson's second wife. His first wife died during his first term in the presidency. During his, uh, well, during his presidency, he met courted and married the young lady, Edith, uh, who became the, the new first lady. Edith Wilson protected President Wilson greatly during this time period. He had a stroke, but she didn't want the world to know how bad it was. So under doctor's orders, he was, he was put in his room, in his bedroom, and for several months, Congress would, would, would pass their laws and they would bring it in, and Colonel House who was at the time Secretary of State, would bring the laws in, give them to Miss Wilson, and say, we need the President's signature. And she would go into the room by herself and then come back out a few minutes later with this law either signed or vetoed. Now, we found out years later that during large parts of this, Wilson was in a coma, and Edith Wilson was signing the President's name. So we had somewhat of an illegal presidency for a few months, where Edith Wilson was the unelected president of the United States. Um, so I guess you could say we have had a female president. She just wasn't elected, and uh, she did a pretty good job, so everybody kind of looked the other way. But the White House is paralyzed by this. And when 1918 came along, we have a midterm election, Wilson's actions Made him, made him seem distant and, and difficult to get along with. He had also not included any Republicans on the Peace Treaty Commission to end World War I because he didn't want the Republican Party to get any credit for ending the war. He wanted all the credit to go to him and the Democrats. So he let, left the country, he went to Versailles, he negotiates this treaty, and he comes back. But while he's gone, the election is going on. The campaign season's afoot, and he's not in the United States to defend himself or his party. The Republicans pointed out that the wartime taxes were very, very high, and these taxes were hurting the economy, and they hung that around Wilson's neck like an albatross. As a result, 
the Republicans sweep control of Congress and they take control of both the House and the Senate. So Wilson, because of his own uh, Byzantine actions to try and keep glory for himself, cost his party control of both houses of Congress. Now he has to bring his peace treaty back. And here's the problem. This peace treaty that he has negotiated without any Republicans, because he wanted all the credit, now he has to get it back, and he has to get it passed by, by a Senate that is controlled by the Republicans that just swept the election. You can imagine that's not going to go very well. They don't want to give him any credit. So he brings this treaty back, the Treaty of Versailles, that the United States wrote that President Wilson himself pushed down the throat of the world. We forced England to sign it, France to sign it, Italy to sign it. We forced Germany to sign it. All of these nations, we put pressure on them to sign it. And now he brings it back, hands it to the Senate, and the Senate says, we're not going to accept it. They vote against it. And there's a couple of groups. There's a, the mild reservationists. I think this is where I would have been if I was a, a member of Congress at this time. The mild reservationists say, uh, we're okay with the peace treaty. We're, we're, we're okay with ending the war. But we don't like the League of Nations. We want to scrap the League of Nations because they're afraid that the League of Nations is going to drag the U.S. into another war. By the way, they were right. We called it World War II. Okay? Then there were the strong reservationists. The strong reservationists say, uh, you can't just fix the League of Nations. You have to scrap it completely. It's not possible to, to, to fix it. We have to have no, out, no alliances at all. Uh, pretty, pretty powerful place. And then there's another third called the Irreconcilables. The Irreconcilables are not going to vote for any legislation that has Wilson's name on it. Period. These are your hardcore stalwart Republicans that just will not give Wilson a, uh, a break. Well, between these three, they're able to stop the treaty from being signed. And the United States, the single most powerful country in the world, the country that wrote the Versailles Treaty and forced the world <laughs> to sign it, as a result, never signs the treaty. And this is what kills the League of Nations because we didn't become part of it, okay? You can't have a national or international power that the strongest nation in the world is not part of, okay? So 1920 comes along. Wilson really wanted to run for re-election again himself, but he didn't have the health for it, and he was worried after losing the midterms that he'd also lose uh, the 1920 election. So he kind of hand chooses his, his uh, successor. He picks this guy, James Cox. That's him there on the left up there, James Cox. Uh, again, Wilson's hand chosen successor. The Republicans decided to do something different. They went up into Ohio and they picked this guy, Warren Harding. By the way, Ohio has had more presidents than any other state has. And the reason why is because for most of our nation's history, Ohio was the biggest state. Uh, it's it not anymore, but for a long part, period of time it was. Warren Harding, that's him on the right. Warren Harding was a strange choice. He was a uh, newspaper publisher, and he'd been in Congress, uh, but he, he, wasn't a, he wasn't a really well-known national figure. Um, but they, they asked him, they asked Mr. Harding, what he wants to do. And they, they vetted the candidate. I don't know if y'all know what vetting is. I've ran for office before, so I understand vetting. It's the scariest thing you will ever do in your life, okay? When you vet a candidate, they come up to you and they say, have you ever in your life done anything that would embarrass you, your family, or our political party if it comes out? At which point you get out a book and you start writing down everything you've ever done. Okay, uh, and today when you do it, they then go back and ask everybody you've ever met. They're talking to your third grade teacher. They're talking to everybody because they want to know what you have done in your life that's going to come out. Well, back then vetting wasn't quite so 
advanced. They just asked you. Mr. Hardy, have you ever done anything that would embarrass you, your family, or the Republican Party? He says, nope, nothing, not a thing. I am clean, no problem. And they believed him and accepted it. Now, what he could have said was, I drink a little bit. Drinking was illegal in Ohio at this time. Or, I have a gambling problem. He did. He gambled a lot. Or, I've had a 12-year affair with my best friend's wife. Also true for him. But instead, he says, nothing. There's nothing out there. So he gets the nomination. And his campaign is one of the weirdest campaigns in history. I see a lot of comparisons to the Trump campaign in some ways. He promises America what he calls a return to normalcy. I find this funny because normalcy is not a word. The correct word is normality. But he says, I'll give you a return to normalcy. What he meant, what he meant by that was, we're going to go back to the way things were before World War I. When things were good, we're going to go back to that. And then we ask him, well, how are you going to do that? And he wouldn't have an answer. In fact, his answers were so wild and uncomprehensible that they invented a word for it. The word is called bloviating. It's not a word that existed before Warren Hardy. It was made up for Warren Hardy. <laughs> to bloviate means to talk around a subject and refuse to answer a question. I'll give you an example. If they asked you, candidate such and such, what are you going to do about the deficit? And you looked at him and you said, that is a really good question, but let me tell you what's really important. We've got to solve this problem in Iraq. And you began talking about the war in Iraq. You did not answer the question. You bloviated. You went around it. Well, that's what Warren Harding does. And he does it very effectively. Warren Harding wins the presidency pretty easily in 1920. Um, and surprisingly, none of his scandals come out, at least not immediately. They don't find out about his girlfriends or his gambling and all this. Um, he does bring a lot of his friends from Ohio when he puts them in the White House. So he has a poker game going in the White House all the time. Uh, rumor has it that he has, a, there, there's a door. There's a door in the president's office, in the closet that you can open up one door and you go in and there's another door on the back side. And rumor has it, it's just, it's just a rumor, that that was put in by Warren Harding so he could sneak his girlfriend out. If his wife came in, he'd open the closet, stick her in, close the door, and she'd open the back door and go out to the other offices. Uh, we don't know that, we just know that, there, that that closet's there. But let's talk about Harding's plans. Harding does have some interesting ideas. And I like Harding's disarmament plan for purposes of history, because I think it explains things. He came up with a five power treaty. Harding was one of the early people that believed that the reason why we had war was because we had too many weapons. Well, we hear that idea a lot today. The reason people die is because there's too many guns. Well, he's kind of the same concept. We had this giant military, people are gonna use it. We should disarm. So he came up with this idea called the Fixed Ratio Five Power Treaty. And he said that we're going to depend on these five nations to, to protect the world. Okay? They're going to, they're going to protect our, our seas. The USA will get to have 525,000 tons worth of ship. That means that you can do it however you want to. You can have two aircraft carriers or 15 frigates, whatever but 525,000 metric tons of this plant. Great Britain got 525,000 tons. Japan, 315,000. And then France and Italy get 175,000 apiece. This is a weird idea, but we've seen this before. Do you remember when we studied Theodore Roosevelt and there was that pyramid that I had up there that said how he saw the world organized and there was the few great powers and then the small European powers, and then Japan was the only one that was listed from Asia. That's what this is. He just took Theodore Roosevelt's idea and he laid it onto this plan. 
There would also be a 10 year holiday on building any new battleships. No new ships could be built for 10 years. Uh, it passed. And we went out and scuttled several million uh, tons worth of ships. We just took them out and sunk them. Some of these ships were still being built from, for World War I. They weren't even completed yet. And we just towed them out to sea and scuttled them because we had to have 525,000 tons and no more. Uh, horrible waste of uh, economics, especially when we know that 20 years later we're gonna have to build all these ships for World War II. It wasn't effective, by the way. If anybody ever tells you the way to stop a war is to disarm, just point to this and go explain to me World War II. Because it didn't stop it, okay? Let's look at Harding's view on business. Harding was very much a president that favored business over everything else. He believed the way to grow the economy was to give tax breaks to the wealthy, tax breaks to big business, to encourage economic growth. Now, people get beat up for that a lot. You hear that a lot today. They're just giving tax breaks to the rich. I got news for you, economically, it's worked every time they did it, and it worked for hard. It spurred the economy because these uh, businesses getting the tax cuts, that gave them more money to hire more people. That's what spurred our growth. Now, he didn't do a lot of, didn't do everything right because this puts a high tariff. A tariff is a tax on the imported goods. The, the tariff is going to hurt things a little bit, but he is able to reduce the national debt. Warren Harding is uh, one of the very few presidents in history to reduce the national debt. Now, he doesn't eliminate, but it becomes much, much smaller under Harding. Harding is an interesting president to me as a historian because in his own life, Harding is remembered as, uh, or is loved. During his life, he is one of the most popular presidents that we ever had. But today, Warren Harding is almost always remembered as a failed presidency. In fact, Harding is frequently listed as one of the worst presidents in history. He's up there with John Quincy Adams and Jimmy Carter when they start being uh, failed presidencies, okay? So what happened? Well, what happened was a bunch of scandals came out. First off, we came up with, or we found out about Teapot Dome. Teapot Dome uh, was, a, was a spot where we got oil from the ground. It's owned by the national government, and this oil was used for the national reserves. It was oil that was put back for use by the military and in times of emergency that to spur the economy. Well, it turned out that his secretary of the interior was pumping oil out of this land and selling it himself and putting the money in his pocket. Now, there is no evidence whatsoever that Warren Harding was aware that this was going on. But it was still his advisor that did it, his appointee that did, does it. So Teapot Dome is the biggest scandal. You had, uh, you had people smuggling money out of the Department of Indian Affairs. You had people uh, stealing money from the Treasury. All this was going on by Harding's appointees. Here's the, the big thing, though. We didn't find out about all these scandals until after Warren Harding died. In 1923, he passes away, and all these scandals emerge shortly thereafter. They find out about his girlfriend. They find out about his gambling. They find out about Teapot Dome. So this man that dies, one of the most loved men in history, within just a few short years, is hated and despised by the average American. By the way, I'm going to give Harding one bit of credit. He did fight very, very hard for equal rights for minorities in a time period when that was an unpopular thing to do. He argued vehemently that blacks and women should have equal rights to men. Uh, I'll give him credit for that. All right, so 1924 comes along. We have another election. Calvin Coolidge is the Republican candidate. He had been Harding's vice president. 
John W. Davis is the Democrat. And that creepy looking guy at the bottom that looks like Harry Houdini, Robert La Follette, is the progressive candidate. He does kind of look like a child predator. I expect to see him on to catch a predator. Uh, Calvin Coolidge is a, he wins this election, but he does it in a weird way. Calvin Coolidge is not interested in doing anything as president. In fact, his nickname was Silent Cal Coolidge because he never said five words. Uh, he bragged about how if he is elected president, he planned to spend most of his day on the front porch in his rocking chair because the government shouldn't be doing very much anyway. Uh, Calvin Coolidge is today a big hero of, uh, of, of modern libertarians. But at the time period, this seemed weird. We had all these progressives, and now we have this guy, Silent Cal Coolidge. By the way, there's a joke about him uh, that the, a lady came up to him when he was running for president and said, uh, Mr. Coolidge, my friends bet me five bucks that I couldn't get you to say five words. And she laughed and giggled. And Calvin Coolidge looked at her and said, I bet you can't, and walked away. Uh, that, that's kind of, kind of the way Calvin Coolidge is. He's not interested in playing games or anything else. So Coolidge gets 382 votes, Davis gets 136, and La Follette gets Wisconsin. So, um, you know, it's not, it's not really even close. So why did we have this boom in the 1920s? This boom of the 1920s is because America was in a business economy. The idea is that the business of America is business. That's a quote from Calvin Coolidge. Whatever is good for business is good for America. And whatever is good for business is good for every American. Okay? So tax cuts for big business, good for everybody. That's his idea. But we also had this massive technological growth at this time period. All these new appliances appeared. Uh, I don't know if y'all, this is Texas, so a lot of times we call our refrigerator an icebox. But it's not really an icebox anymore. Uh, my great grandmother had an icebox when I was a kid, but actually delivered ice. Well, this is when refrigerators came out for the first time. You didn't have to do that anymore. Everybody had to go buy a refrigerator. Washing machines came out. Everybody went and bought a washing machine. Automobiles came out. Uh, all this stuff is happening. And that's going to spur economic growth, okay? All these new inventions. Synthetics, like nylon. By the way, nylon was invented. I know we think of nylon like for ladies' hose and stuff. And women don't wear hose anymore. But it was invented for parachutes, okay? They just were That's terrible. It's terrible. And that was recorded. Uh, <laughs> Plastic was also invented at this time period, although not used very, very effectively. So all this stuff is happening. The first chain stores, Montgomery Ward, Woolworths, A&P, all of this stuff is happening in the 1920s. But while we had all this great economic growth, we also had the bad side. We had a new kind of isolationism that was happening. America was turning in on itself. At the end of World War I, there was so much violence and so much uh, uh, blood and carnage that we never wanted to do that again. And the lesson we learned from World War I was stay out, stay out of foreign affairs. Because remember, it was our alliances that pulled us in, right? All those entangling alliances is what caused World War I. So we don't like this internationalism. And one of the side effects of isolationism at this time is the first Red Scare. Red is the old name for the communists. 1919, 1920. This guy, A. Mitchell Palmer. A. Mitchell Palmer was the Attorney General of the United States. And he's put in charge of stopping the spread of communism. That makes, makes that his... his his goal. 
The problem is what he defines as a communist. Remember, the slogan of the Communist Party, of the Soviets, was workers of the world unite. And the whole communist idea was that everything would be owned by the workers, and you wouldn't have management anymore. Everything is, the workers run everything. Workers are more valuable than management. Well, he looks at that, and he starts identifying unions as communists because they're organizing workers. And the IWW, the International Workers of the World, that was a, that was a very large union at the time. They were called the Wobblies. And a lot of them were communists. But he identifies them as a communist organization. And he takes the Justice Department and takes federal agents and kicks in the doors of these union places and literally with bats and, uh, and axes tears apart the printing presses they had so they couldn't send out their, their brochures anymore. He's very violent. He rounded up about 6,000 communists in raids. By the way, most of them turned out to be Jewish union members. In 1919, he deported 249 people that he called radicals. All 249 were Jewish immigrants that had come to the United States and because they had joined these unions and adopted some very socialistic or communist ideas, he deported them. He kicked them out of the country. By the way, the ship they went on, the Buford, ends up settling them in Germany. So we sent 249 Jews to Germany in 1919. Okay? This is what we are doing. Now, everybody doesn't like this. This is also a violent time period. A. Mitchell Palmer had a, had a letter bomb delivered to his house, a parcel. Uh, the, uh, the guy blew himself up when he was delivering it. His plan was that he was going to put this on the front porch and ring the doorbell. The maid would get it, take it inside, and it would blow up and kill everybody. But as he's walking up the steps, he apparently tripped, and the bomb went off, and he blew himself up along with... Uh, part of A. Mitchell Palmer's house. But this is what's going on. We have bombs being delivered to our attorney general. This is how violent things are. Uh, we already talked about the limitations on freedom of speech. He literally breaks presses up because they have communist ideas. Now, guys, I got news for you. I hate communism. I hate socialism. I hate everything about it. But you know what I hate worse is somebody that breaks up printing presses to stop free speech. And that's what he was doing. Okay. Let's look at another example of the Red Scare, and that's the Sacco Vanzetti case. Nicholas Sacco and Bartolomeo Vanzetti. These are Italian immigrants to Massachusetts, and they were known to be anarchists. You don't know what anarchy is? It's the absence of law. They had moved here from Italy. They had been to several anarchy uh, rallies where they really wanted there to be no laws, the government just to stop, stop existing. Well, they worked at a shoe factory in Massachusetts, and the paymaster was murdered in a robbery. Now, nobody saw who did it. There was no evidence left behind. But Sacco and Vanzetti were spotted walking down the road a couple of miles away from the factory afterwards, and they were arrested. They found no evidence on them. There was no gun. There was no money on them. Sacco and Vanzetti went to their death, claiming to be innocent to this. But at the trial, they are found guilty. Now, at the end of this, I've got some, some terms here. These are all terms the judge used to describe these people, okay? A judge is supposed to be an, an, an unbiased person. And he described these guys as Italians, atheists, anarchists, and draft dodgers. Now, Italian, true, no problem. Atheists, nope, they're Roman Catholic. Anarchists, yeah, probably. Draft dodgers. How could they be draft dodgers? They're not citizens. They can't be drafted. They can't serve in the military. But all of these things are, are <coughs> excuse me, are brought up against them. 
um, they are convicted and they are sentenced to death. Now, here's the deal. Because they were sentenced to death with no evidence, most historians will argue that this is a case of racism, nativism, and, and red scare. They're right. It is. But let me point this out to you too. Today, almost every historian accepts that these guys were guilty. They probably got it right. Now, how they got it right was wrong. What they went about doing was wrong. It was an example of serious racism. But these guys probably did do, do, do the killing. The reason they do that, I, I say that, is because uh, there was a book written about these guys, Sacco Vanzetti, uh, by Upton Sinclair, the same guy that wrote The Jungle. He wrote a book about these. And later on in life, when he dies, we find his notes. And he had interviewed them in, the, in prison. And in his notes, it, they apparently had confessed that they did it to him. And uh, that, 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 that's, that's where we, we take that from. All right, other examples of racism. The Ku Klux Klan gets a revival in the 1920s. In fact, it doesn't just get a revival. It gets a whole new facelift and becomes bigger than ever. The new Ku Klux Klan comes out of Stone Mountain, Georgia, and is founded by a dentist. And he tries to sell it as a Christian organization. Okay? He is no longer saying that we're wearing robes because, you know, we're the ghosts of fallen Confederates. He's saying these are purity robes. These are symbols of our purity with God. And families actually show up. And wives with their children all show up with their robes on and go to these Klan rallies. Now, it's also not just an anti-black organization anymore. By this time, it's anti-everything except white Anglo-Saxon Protestants. If you're a wasp, you're okay. Otherwise, they hate you. Look at what they're against. They're against foreigners. They're against Catholics. They're against blacks, Jews. They're anti-Semitic. They don't like Jewish people. They don't like pacifists if you don't fight. They're against birth control. Uh, the reason they're against birth control, the, the pill was something brand new at that time. They believe that that led to uh, adultery. So they're against that. They're against gambling. They're uh, uh, against drinking in some cases. Uh, all of this stuff is happening. And they got massively large. In fact, so large that they had Supreme Court justices elected. In the state of Indiana, Indiana it got so big that every elected official at a state level in Indiana was a member of the KKK. Okay? Uh, it is massively large. Still around today, kind of a joke today. This is also the age of prohibition. The 18th Amendment was passed. By the way, pushed through in large part by the Ku Klux Klan, okay? The 18th Amendment outlawed the production, consumption, and distribution of alcohol, okay? Uh, very popular in the Midwest and the South, not so popular in the North, where, they, where the Irish like to drink a lot still. But in the South and the Midwest, it was very popular. What is the result going to be of this? the birth of organized crime. We had no organized crime in this country. We had crime, we didn't have organized crime until prohibition. Why did it organize? Well, because now there was a product they could smuggle in. And they were sort of smuggling in illegal alcohol from Canada mostly. Guys like Al Capone, that's him at the bottom, uh, becomes famous and rich by by smuggling in the uh, uh, illegal alcohol. In the 1920s, there's about 500 people killed in gang wars. There's a picture of one up there, and I apologize for the graphicness of that. It's kind of hard for y'all to see. But that's from the St. Valentine's Day Massacre, where a rival gang came into Chicago wanting to sell alcohol, and Al Capone dressed his enforcers up as police officers, pulled them over, and then when he got them out of the car, Tommy gunned them to death. Um, this is what was going on at this time period. So why have prohibition? 
there's a few goals of prohibition. The main goal is to eliminate drunkenness. Uh, women were pushing this because they were getting abused. And their logic was the reason why husbands were abusing their wives was because of alcohol. Demon rum, they call it. Uh, they also want to get rid of all saloons because not only is this where alcohol is done, but prostitution and gambling happens there. And last one, this is one they used to sell a lot, to make America's business better because you could cut down on absenteeism and accidents if people were sober. Well, that's probably true. Uh, this next picture is one of my favorite pictures. I get a kick out of it every time I see it. I've been looking at it for 30 years and I still laugh when I see it. I hope you enjoy it as much as I do. This is a real advertisement, okay? This is not a parody. This is a real advertisement by the, uh, the Temperance League to try and push prohibition through. Lips that touch liquor shall not touch ours. So you don't get to kiss the fat, ugly old women if you drink, okay? <laughs> I am sorry, but if I had to kiss those women, I would have to drink, okay? That's, that's, that's the story. But this was a real ad, and I put this up here so you could see how serious people were about this. Especially that one there in the middle. Ooh, what is she wearing? Looks like look on this. <laughs> you recognize the one at the far left, by the way? I bet somebody recognizes her. And B from, uh, from May Mayberry. Really? Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, from uh, uh, Andy Griffith's show. She was in favor of prohibition. She was. Hmm. Boy, he... <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. She was. We are also a mass consumption society. For the first time ever, uh, we have assembly lines that are pushing out product larger than we've ever seen. Henry Ford's Rouge River plant was so large and had so many lines going through that at one point they were putting out a finished car every 10 seconds. Now, the cars weren't what we would expect today. Uh, this is what a car would have looked like at that time period. This is, the model, this is the Model T here. The Model T Ford came in any color you wanted as long as you wanted it in black, and it went 35 miles per hour. But, you know, that, you that was a big improvement. Not all I need. Maybe all you need. I've seen you drive. I know what horse was behind. So how does the automobile industry generate wealth? Well, first off, we had a rubber industry for the first time ever. Uh, tires. So we didn't have, we didn't, there really was no use for, for rubber on a large scale. Petroleum. Guys, before automobiles came about, if you were drilling a well and you hit oil, it was a nuisance because you wanted water. What would you do with the oil? Well, now with cars, there's an oil industry, and Texas exploded uh, in, in wealth. Uh, not my family. We sold our stuff off for pennies on the dollar and invested the money in a trolley company because we are smart businessmen in my family. I'm telling you, if there's an Alberts family reunion, there's an empty Kmart and 12 Step program somewhere. All right, tourism. There was no such thing as tourism before, uh, before the automobile. How would, you, how would you go somewhere? How would you go see anything? Uh, road construction. Somebody's gotta build all these roads these cars are gonna go on. Taxes. Taxes. This is also... Taxes. Taxation is theft, I know, I know. This is also the beginning of an automobile culture. And the automobile changes our culture a lot. For instance, the suburbs can happen. Now, all three of these campuses here are, are, are in rural areas, so we may not be so familiar with suburbs, but that's the little towns outside the cities, okay? Urban is the city, suburban is outside the city, okay? For the first time in history, you could live outside of the city you worked in. Now you could drive in, okay? That's gonna change things, because if mom and dad are driving into town to go to work, there's nobody to watch what kid is doing at home. That's going to change our, our culture. Uh, accidents increase. Uh, morality will change. There will be moral decay because you'll have more freedom. The example I always give my kids, I remember back when I was in high school, back in the dark ages. 
or probably still true today. I was more likely to misbehave when I drove to the next town up the road than I was in the town I lived in. Because in the town I lived in, everybody knew who I was and, and knew who my mother was. But I could drive 30 miles down the road to a little bigger city. Nobody knows who my mama is and I can do whatever I want. Well, the automobile allows that to happen. Suddenly you can get out of town. You can go where you're not known and it gives you a sense of anonymity. That's gonna change our morality. The flapper is born. This picture is the flapper. The flapper was the independent woman of the 1920s. And by the way, she's called that because of the way they look when they dance doing the Charleston. They literally look like they're just flapping around, okay? If you don't know what the Charleston is, well, y'all are even too young for me to make the 90s reference. You've seen the old rock, old videos from the 90s. The dance the kitten play they used to do, that's the Charleston, okay? It's the Charleston the hip hop music. Uh, but women start doing, start dressing different. Look at the way they're dressed. <coughs> now that may seem very old fashioned to you, but compare it to the Victorians, how their mothers dressed. Their mothers were the Victorians that wore the, the collars all the way up to their the, uh, the, the top of their, or, or the bottom of their chin and the veils and hats and gloves and dresses to the floor. These women are showing their ankles. They're wearing sleeveless. They're bobbing their hair, they're wearing lots of makeup. This is a much more modern person, okay? And they were drinking. And they were having pet parties, and that's exactly what it sounds like. You lock yourself in a, in a closet with a, with a boy or a girl and see how, how much you can get away with in 10 minutes, okay? This is games they were playing. It was a sexual revolution in the 1920s. Uh, so things are changing pretty quickly. It's also the beginning of the jazz age, the 20s. Now, I know y'all don't like jazz music probably, I love it, but a lot of you probably don't like jazz. But jazz comes out of New Orleans, and it's the music they used to play in the bars and the brothels, okay? Jazz is actually a, a uh, New, New Orleans slang term for sex. So jazz music was the music that was played in houses of ill repute, okay? Um, you had some famous guys like Duke Ellington, Louis Armstrong, Benny Good. All these guys come out of New Orleans and they bring this new sound with them. And jazz was different. It was a music for a youthful generation. This is a very young generation. That's part of why they're different. A lot of their dads didn't come back from World War I. Okay? So you've got people that came of age and they're outnumbering their parents. By the way, that's what your generation is doing to me, and I'm not going to forgive you. There's more of you than there are of me. All right. We're going to stop there for the day. I will pick up here on uh, Wednesday. I know, well, our guys here are not going to be in here. Y'all are going to be in SATs, but I'll record what I have so you can watch it. Don't forget, you've got a study guide out there to start working on. Uh, the test is at least a week away still, so you've got some time. I've got to get through this lecture and the FDR lecture, uh, so at least a week, probably a week and a half away. Uh, I think I'll lecture uh, Wednesday this week, Monday, Wednesday next week, and we'll try and have a test probably that next Wednesday. So start working in your study guide. I will see you all around. Have a good day. If you need anything, I'll be here for a few minutes. I won't be back in here until next Wednesday. Okay. What do you want for